Hello, YouTubers and NFL and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my Week 10 2023 NFL predictions. Well, for the fanatic this week, after having a mid week, definitely with my against the spread and straight up picks, this week I was able to rebound incredibly nicely and get a much better against the spread and straight up record for both. For both my against this, my my spread and straight up picks this week, uh, after starting out zero and two due to the Thursday and Frankfurt Germany game of KC and Miami, going zero and two both against the spread and straight up, uh, I was able to win nine. The next nine games, um, or after after starting out zero and two, and then the other couple after that. I was able to win nine games straight from both an own uh, four start, both against the spread and straight up. You look at how my picks went. So I will gladly take being nine and four against the spread and straight up. That equals sixty nine point two percent. And uh, I was, I forgot uh, to update my uh, against the spread pick for the Cardinals Browns game yesterday, uh, because I didn't know that Deshaun Watson was starting, and Clayton Toon was going to be the starter for the uh, Cardinals. So, if I would have made that update, I'm not going to change it because I, I didn't make it in time, but I probably would have changed my against the spread pick of Cleveland from the Arizona plus 7.5 to Cleveland minus 7.5. And, and they won by 20, and they held the Cardinals to their fewest amount of yards uh, that any team has had this year. I believe they only had 58 total yards the entire game. So that was absolutely brutal there. Uh, but with those against the spread and straight up records of nine and four now through 135 games, I am against the spread now back above 500. Now it's 67 and 65 and three against the spread and straight up now I am 84 and 51. So that equals up to 50.7% uh, against the spread. So I am back to being above 500 through nine weeks of the season, which is fantastic. I am incredibly thrilled with that. I have a two game cushion. Uh, with three pushes, so it's not the it's not the greatest of cushions and everything going on. Who knows? But I feel pretty good about where this season is going, especially with how the games are going. That I feel like I can probably hold on and maintain and have my first ever winning record on against the spread predictions. Or straight up, I got a nine and four week, get a double digit win uh, with the Chargers game tonight. And once again, I will remind everyone I am taking the Chargers tonight minus two and a half. Uh, I would still take the Chargers. I believe that line has loomed up in real time now to the Los Angeles Chargers minus three and a half. So in that way, I will uh, fully acknowledge that um, I will take, I'm going to take the Chargers regardless, two and a half or three and a half against the spread and straight up tonight over the New York Jets. So, but what a crazy week in the NFL it was, as they always are. You had Josh Dobbs pull off one of the great feats I've seen all time in the fact that uh, he was the first quarterback in NFL history to have three or more touchdowns with two different teams in the same week, <laughs> which which is insane. He did not even know the center. He didn't even know any of the teammates. He had no practice reps the entire week because he got traded there at the trade deadline. And after 11 snaps, after their the rookie quarterback, Jaron Hall, former BYU quarterback, went down, Josh Dobbs comes in and puts up a phenomenal performance that I think guaranteed his future in the NFL for at least next year. He will be on an NFL roster next year. I don't think he is a uh, great starting quarterback or a very good starting quarterback. But if you're telling me a backup quarterback, he's arguably a top six or seven backup quarterback from what I've seen this year from how he can play. And to come into that spot against the Falcon team that was leading their division at home, but even down it, was incredibly impressive. That was wild. The Rams-Packers game was an absolute dud of just ineptitude. It was a 10-3 game going into the fourth quarter. And then uh, I think Carlson made a field goal. Rippy made a mistake. And then Luke Musgrave, shout out to him, caught his first career touchdown. And that equaled a victory. For the uh, Green Bay Packers to get to three and five, the Raiders. Since the last time I talked to you all, 
fired head coach Josh McDaniels. Thank the good Lord there is accountability because that has been in pathetic scum. Can now leave the NFL until he gets whisked away back into New England for a third time. And the Raiders, due to that response, played their best game of the year objectively. They, even though I know they played the Giants without Daniel Jones, who has torn his ACL and is now out for the year, and Tyrod Taylor has a rib injury. So the starting quarterback for the New York Giants this week is either going to be USC mid quarterback Matt Barkley, who's been around the league for over 10 years and has done basically nothing. Or the immortal Tommy DeVito, who at least drew for a 175 yards and a touchdown to show that he actually can throw the ball in a forward motion. But, uh, you know, but Antonio Pierce, though, a 24-point win. Max Crosby having three sacks. Josh Jacobs having the most rushes and yards along with two touchdowns. He's had the entire year. And the Raiders look like they actually had a lot of fun and a lot of motivation playing for them for the first time since McDaniels left. And they are, I think, and they have taken every opportunity they can Take a shot at him, which to me is telling. But um, when I, you know, that that was a crazy moment. Uh, Cowboys Eagles, what a game that was! That was insane to see both teams objectively play effective football. Dak played a pretty good game, three touchdowns, a, a lot of uh, solid plays to see Lamb who had over 150 yards. I think he has had back to back. 150 yard games, which is massive for the Cowboys. He's the, uh, I think the first Cowboys receiver to have back to back 150, 150 yard games. Uh, the defense came up huge in the fourth quarter, but they only held the Eagles to 16 total yards. However, unfortunately, they could not stop them in the third quarter. And due to basically the end lines of uh, Ferguson and Dak, they did not get a grand total of up to eight points that basically would have changed the game in key spots so that was a crazy game and then uh i'll talk about the rest of the games here in a second but i, I just want to shout out cj stroud for having the best rookie game i have ever seen a rookie play in totality holistically 470 five touchdowns no interceptions has the highest td interception ratio since tom brady did in 2016 at 16 to 1 i think he's had a couple fumbles which is a little concerning but you know, which is, you know, it's been sporadic. So he is not a turnover machine like Josh Allen or Bryce Young, his uh, number one pick counterpart. But Bryce Young is here to stay. And I do believe, I'm sorry, C.J. Stroud, not Bryce Young. C.J. Stroud is here to stay. And I believe the Texans have found their franchise quarterback. And to me, he's already the second best quarterback in their franchise history. The only one that you could argue that I don't think he's maybe reached yet is Deshaun. Because Deshaun, in his rookie year, he they were about 500 both ways through, but we're just playing sensationally. Hopefully the same thing doesn't happen to Sean will happen to CJ, or he tore his ACL that rookie year, and that basically ended that campaign. But I think CJ Stroud is a legitimate franchise quarterback that will carry the Texans very far and uh, very high places moving forward with that much confidence, ability, and consistency that I've seen through the first eight games. So I want to shout out the, wanted to shout that out real quickly. Uh, and let me say before I get into my picks, we have another week of four teams on by. So the Kansas City Chiefs, the Los Angeles Rams, the Miami Dolphins, and the Philadelphia Eagles are all on by this week. So if you have Patrick Mahomes, Isaiah Pacheco, Travis Kelsey, the Chiefs defense, Harrison Butker, Tua, Jalen, Tyreek, Dolphins defense, Jason Sanders, Duran Smythe, the Rams defense. I forget who the Rams kicker is now because they, they cut uh, Brett Maher. Tyron Williams, Stafford, Cup, Puka, Tyler Higby, Jalen Hurts, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard, Eagles defense, Jake Kelly. If you have any of those players on your fantasy teams, mention them because they will not be playing uh, this weekend. All right, so time for my picks for this week. So on Thursday, in the battle for I don't know who you want to win or lose, or basically for the Bears, the ultimate benefit game because they get to move their draft pick up or down either way, when the 1-7 Carolina Panthers travel to Chicago to take on the 3-6, and six, I'm sorry, the 2-7, uh, and seven, when, yeah, we have, when the 1-7 Carolina Panthers travel to Chicago to take on the 2-7 and seven Chicago Bears, the Chicago Bears are 3.5 point favorites in this game, 
give me Carolina here plus three and a half, but I'm going to take Chicago straight up. And I just want to put a caveat into this. Uh, because of Justin Fields' possible playing of this game and his injury, if Justin Fields does play, and I'm going to put this down in the video, I'm going to change my against the spread pick and go with Chicago minus three and a half or whatever that line is going to get to if he plays. So, once again, I have uh, Chicago here straight up with Carolina plus three and a half, but if Justin Fields does play, I will change my spread pick to Chicago minus three and a half or whatever the spread, if it's in reason, is for that game. So, then the last international game of the year when the four and five Indianapolis Colts travel to New England to take on the two and seven New England Patriots. The Indianapolis Colts are two point favorites in this game. Give me Indianapolis here minus two, Indianapolis straight up. Then the next game when the four and four Houston Texans travel to Cincinnati to take on the five and three Cincinnati Bengals. Cincinnati Bengals are seven point favorites in this game. Give me Houston here plus seven, but I'm going to take Cincinnati straight up. Then the next game when the five and four New Orleans Saints travel to Minnesota to take on the five and four Minnesota Vikings in a huge wild card battle for seeding. Uh, the New Orleans Saints are two and a half point favorites in this game. Give me New Orleans here minus two and a half in New Orleans straight up. Then the next game, when the 3-5 and five Green Bay Packers travel to Pittsburgh, take on the 5-3 and three Pittsburgh Steelers. The Pittsburgh Steelers are 3.5-point favorites in this game. Give me Pittsburgh here, minus 3.5, and, and Pittsburgh straight up. Then the next game, when the... Let's see. When the 3-6 and six Tampa Bay Buccaneers travel... I'm sorry, when the 3-5, and five, sorry... The three and five Tampa Bay Buccaneers travel. Uh, let, me let, me let me restart. When the three and five Tampa Bay Buccaneers host the three and five Tennessee Titans. There we go. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers are one point favorites in this game. I'm going to take the Tampa Bay Buccaneers here minus one and Tampa Bay straight up. Then the next game, when the five and three San Francisco 49ers travel to Jacksonville, take on the six and two Jacksonville Jaguars. The San Francisco 49ers are three-point favorites, amazingly, in this game. Give me in a in a uh, one of my two upset picks here. I'm going to take uh, Jacksonville here, plus three, and Jacksonville straight up. Then the next game, when the 5-3 and three Cleveland Browns travel to Baltimore to take on the 7-2 Baltimore Ravens, the Baltimore Ravens are six-point favorites in this game. Give me the Baltimore Ravens here to win straight up, but I'm going to take Cleveland plus six. Then the next game, when the 4-5 and five Atlanta Falcons travel to Arizona to take on the 2-1-7 and, or I'm sorry, the one and seven Arizona Cardinals, the Atlanta Falcons are 2.5-point favorites in this game. In probably one of the very few times I'm going to take Arizona, I'm going to take Arizona here in an upset. Arizona plus 2.5 and, and Arizona straight up. This is all based off of if Kyler Murray will play. He's had at least three weeks off and has been a full participant of practice for the last two weeks. Uh, so the 21-day window is closing to put him on the active roster, and I, I do believe he will play. If it is Clayton Toon that gives Nathan Peterman a run for the worst quarterback that you ever see play a National Football League game starts, I will switch my pick to Atlanta against the spread and straight up regardless. But I do believe the Kyler is going to play, and I think that is definitely enough to push the Cardinals over the Falcons in a unique game of ineptitude and mediocrity colliding perfectly in Glendale. So, but that's right. Like, right now, I have Arizona plus two and a half. And Arizona straight up. The next game, when the six and two Detroit Lions go to Los Angeles to take on the four and four or three and five Los Angeles Chargers, the Detroit Lions are one and a half point favorites in this game. Give me Detroit here, minus one and a half. And Detroit straight up. Then the next game, when the two and seven... New York Giants tra travel to Dallas to take on the six and sorry when they take on the five and three Dallas Cowboys. The Dallas Cowboys in the biggest spread of the year, very much like a college spread, they are sixteen and a half point favorites against the New York Giants. I don't really like to swallow a lot of points, but the Cowboys have been absolutely dominant at home for the most part. Uh, they have won they've won their games by at least an average of twenty plus points a game. 
So I will definitely take Dallas here, minus 16 and a half, if they're starting DeVito or Barkley. I just hope either one of them or both of them can survive the beating they're going to take behind that mangled and deflated Giants offensive line. So that's why I have Dal- um, that one. Then the next game, then the final three games, when the four and five Washington Commanders travel to Seattle, take on the five and three Seattle Seahawks. The Seattle Seahawks are six point favorites in this game. Give me Seattle here minus six and Seattle straight up. Then in the Sunday night game, when the four and three or when the four and four, five and three New York Jets travel to Las Vegas, take on the four and five Las Vegas Raiders. The New York Jets are two and a half point favorites in this game. Even the New York Jets here minus two and a half. And the New York Jets straight up. And lastly, when the three and five Denver Broncos travel to Buffalo to take on the five and four Buffalo Bills, the Buffalo Bills are seven and a half point favorites in this game. Give me Buffalo here to win straight up, but I'm going to take Denver plus seven and a half. All right, it's time for my quick thoughts on each game. The Chicago Bears over the Carolina Panthers. This is one to where I'm taking the Chicago Bears to beat the Panthers based on the fact of the ineptitude of Bryce Young and the Panthers' offense. In Bryce Young's five of seven starts, they've scored 17 or fewer points in five of the seven starts. He has been absolutely atrocious, inept offensively. The weapons on the outside do not look great. Adam Thielen is their leading receiver with five receiving touchdowns and about three to 400 yards, which is pathetically inept. And that's something to where that defense, due to the problems of Bryce Young, here's a fun little stat here. Kenny Moore got two pick sixes on Bryce Young yesterday. That would actually tie him with DJ Chark and Tommy Tremble for the second most touchdowns a Panther has been thrown to by Bryce Young. Kenny Moore has just as many touchdowns as the other, his other Panthers teammates. And the other thing that I look at the Panthers is that due to that constant turnover, they've given up the second most points in the league, but they do have a top 10 defense in total yards, which I, I think is incredibly impressive in a way that, you know, that front seven and that back end can hold up getting people to limit themselves. The problem is, is that with all the turnovers, it's just putting them in a tougher and tougher spot to keep having to hold. And also, it's interesting, though, because Chicago Bears have also now given up the most passing touchdowns the entire season, which I think is massive. And the Panthers are, are a top 10 team in penalties, which is another reason why I'm going with the Bears over the Panthers. And it's just an aspect of where I think Tyson Bajan in his other home game played okay he did enough to win and I think with the losses of Brian Burns CJ Henderson Shaq Thompson I believe that defense is getting ravaged and mauled by the injury bug that I think the Bears with whoever they start can make enough plays through their running game DJ Moore getting to play his former team he'll be incredibly motivated I believe the Bears grind out a tough and gritty victory against Panther team that is staring down the barrel of the number one overall pick or well, or the Bears are looking at it saying, well, if we win, it lowers their ability to pick, which is ours, and the Bears get to win regardless of what happens on the field uh, Sunday due to that trade. So, But again, if Justin Fields is playing, I'm going to switch my against the spread pick to Chicago. So that's why I like uh, Chicago here straight up, a Carolina plus three and a half. The next game, the Indianapolis Colts over the New England Patriots. Uh, this is one to where the Colts impressively offensively have scored 20 plus points in every single game this year. And the Colts need to, one of the key factors of how they've been able to get a lot of victories is by forcing turnovers. When they have forced at least two or more turnovers in the game, they are 500. They're two and two. When they force one or fewer turnovers, they're two and three. Darius Leonard, I'm going to shout out to him real quickly. He had a fantastic game, 10 total tackles in back-to-back games. And the Colts lost a decent weapon in Josh Downs. He was their big extended deep threat to uh, move the chain and move the balls, or to move the ball effectively. And when you look at the Colts here, they are four and five. And it's weird because they don't have a lot of great core pieces 
and they've had a lot of significant injuries to a lot of big names throughout this year. But I do have to give Steichen his credit because I do think that he's done a phenomenal job of what he's had to work with offensively, with everything going on there. I believe the Colts are in a brighter and more positive-looking direction than they they have been since uh, Chuck Pagano back in 2014. And uh, when you look at the Patriots side of things, here, here was a crazy stat that I found out that is that would probably interest some of the viewers. The Bill Belichick went 361 straight games without having even five games under 500. It was the third best streak in NFL history. And Juju has only had 140 receiving yards this year, though we had a massive drop, which ended the game. He was a tipped interception. I think it was massive. And uh, Ramondre Stevenson had a massive 68-yard run earlier in the game. But if you take that out, the 42 other plays that the 42 other plays that the no 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 sorry when you look at it that way when you look when you look at it that way the Patriots had that one big run and then really did not gain much other offense the rest of the way through and they only held the ball the Pats did for 22 minutes and 50 seconds. So you're not going to win a lot of games when stuff like that happens. And it is an international game, so there's going to be no home field advantage, and I think that is massive because I'm going to take the Colts based off their coaching, the cons- defensive consistency, and at the end of the day, if you're telling me you got Mac and Bill versus Steichen and Minshew, I'll take Steichen and Minshew in this regard based on the creativity of their offense and the ability to innovate and be consistent with offensive formations. Unlike Belichick, who's using crusted and old vet Bill O'Brien. So, but that's why I like uh, New England here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that's why I like Indianapolis here, minus two. Indianapolis straight up. The next game, the Cincinnati Bengals over the Houston Texans. This is one to where I am taking the Cincinnati Bengals over the Houston Texans. Based off the fact that the Bengals just have better receivers, a healthier running back, better defenders, and better coaching. That's all it is. Like, look, Stroud was phenomenal, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, Completed 71.4% of his passes, five touchdowns, no interceptions. The highest pass rating for a rookie in NFL history. Um... He's the youngest player ever with 450 passing yards. And uh, he is only the sixth player to have 450 passing yards and five touchdowns with no interceptions in NFL history. So, what a day for him. Also, I want to shout out Dare Ogunglawable. And I, I know I botched his name horribly. But he, their kicker, Kaimi Fairbairn, went down with a quad injury throughout the game. And they had the kicker make kickoffs and kick two huge clutch kicks or to kick a huge clutch field goal at the end of the game which should have been the end since it was a four-point game Tampa Bay was up 37 to 33 but CJ Stroud and that Houston offense orchestrated a masterful drive to get a uh, slight but effective two-point lead which they ended up winning the game so good for Houston to get the 500 and it was also more impressive because Devin Singletary only ran for 26 yards and for the Bengals, look, ever since it's turned from the Arizona game, they now have won four straight games. Uh, Joe Burrow in that time has completed 77% of his passes for 1,133 yards, 10 touchdowns, and two interceptions over the last four games. And when you look at this game through the last few weeks, they've held opponents to 20 or fewer points defensively, and... They also held the Tampa Bay Buccaneers running attack to its most inept possible since they held the uh, they, they have the uh, they had their lowest amount of rushing yards against the Bills, which is incredibly impressive. But the reason and the Texans have lost three or four to the Bengals, so this is a game that you know through most of the playoffs these two teams know each other from those moments. But in a moment like this, when you have Stroud and Burrow playing as well as they are, you're going to go with the better quarterback in your building 
which is CJ Stroud going into Paycor, where I do not think he will be that great. I think he will play okay, but he might have his second or third interception based on uh, how the Bengals defense is playing for the last few weeks. And you have an individual on the Bengals that Cam Taylor Brett, who's doing a great job limiting defenders on his side of the ball. So, should be a phenomenal game, but I'm going to give Houston with the points because I do think Houston, knowing D'Amico, knowing that staff, and knowing the connections that are there with Shanahan, that D'Amico and that team are going to be prepared to play well. I just think with the Bengals, they hold on in a really tough, impressive physical battle against the uh, Houston Texans. So, that's why I like uh, Cincinnati straight up, but Houston... But Houston plus seven. The next game, the New Orleans Saints over the Minnesota Vikings. This is one to where, look, the Saints keep finding ways to win games. Taysom Hall has become an absolute godsend for him. Let's see here. Taysom Hill has, I believe they said, Gained after at least throwing for a touchdown and running for another throughout this whole time. Uh, he has now 26 rushing touchdowns, 11 touchdown passes, and 10 touchdown receptions. He's only the second player in NFL history with those type of numbers since Frank Gifford back in the early 50s. So that's incredibly impressive how versatile Taysom Hill is. And I, 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 I think it's uh, very admirable because I feel like nobody can do it better than Steve Lard, uh, than than Steve, but I look at the Saints and go, or I'm sorry, is it Frank Gifford? And I know Frank, you know, is a, is a Hall of Famer, but I'm going to trust with the Saints that Taysom Hill will continue to be thrilled and effective in these moments. Also, another big reason why the Saints keep on maintaining the hold victories in tight, low-scoring games is the amount of turnovers they force every single game, it seems like. They, uh... To force the second most turnovers in the league this year. And then the weird fact for the Saints is that Blake Groupie, who made a career long 55 yard field goal, when they needed him to ice the game, he missed a 48 yarder wide to the right. So it's very interesting how very much kickers in the league need to have some confidence moments, or just gonna be like, unless you have a Justin Tucker or a Bucker, to where like every time you don't know if it's gonna go great or not. And it should be like, he shouldn't make the hard stuff look easy and the easy stuff look hard. From what they, from what I've seen. And then, also, it's very interesting where Derek Carr, for his Raider tenure, he is undefeated when he does not commit a turnover at all. When you get at least two turnovers a game on the Saints, they do not do nearly as well. And then you look at it from the Vikings side of you. The Vikings just keep winning about Justin Jefferson. They're now 4-0 without him. And the biggest reason why I'm going with the Saints is because of the injury suffered by these two guys in Cam Akers, who has torn his right Achilles, and K.J. Osborne, who suffered a nasty roughing the passer, unnecessary roughness call by Clay Martin. But that is how we are in this uh, situation. And I just feel like with the Saints that eventually not having Justin Jefferson will catch up to them. And I feel like this is the game that's going to do it, especially against the secondary as dominant as, as this one's been. They have one of the better defenses in the league. And Paulson uh, Adebo has now had three interceptions in the last couple games, so he's becoming a very good ball hawk. For the Saints playing as one of their better corners. But. I genuinely believe. The Saints win this game based off of Dobbs. Not being. In a. Uh, spot. Uh, to win. Could the Vikings win this game? Sure. But I think not having. Cam Akers. KJ Osborne. Justin Jefferson. And their. Uh 
rookie quarterback to help guide Dobbs the other way around. I think the Saints, with that defense, which has been stout and consistent most of the year, I think does its job and wins a tough and gritty physical game in a unique game that will be a huge wild card determiner as the year goes on. So that's why I like New Orleans here. Minus two and a half in New Orleans straight up. The next game. The Pittsburgh Steelers over the Green Bay Packers. This is one to wear. Look, the Green Bay Packers, not great. Their defense was phenomenal because they held the Rams' entire offense to 187 total yards. So also the first time in about a month, Jordan Love did not throw an interception, which is massive. Um, and when you look at the Packers, they're playing a Steeler team that right now is playing unique football. And that, look, I want to give them credit. They had a season high in rushing yards, 166 yards. Uh, so it's impressive that they, they did commit to the run. But Kenny Pickett has been massive in the clutch where he has completed 69.5% of his passes that 831 passing yards and three touchdowns to only one interception through this amount of time in the second half. The first half for Kenny Pickett completes about 54.4% of his passes, 659 yards, three touchdowns to three interceptions. So if only Kenny Pickett could take an entire game, improve his play in the first half, maintain his play in the second half, I believe the Steelers would be in a much better situation than they are now. Also, it's the, the Steelers are the first team in NFL history through eight games to outgain their opponent every single game and to have very poor offensive results come up once again, over and over and over again. It's just incredibly frustrating. And also, when you look at the Steelers with Will Levis, this is what I told everybody about last week. Him trying to stay in some, you know, spots. It's not going to work out that well. The Steelers are now undefeated at home against rookie quarterbacks. Tomlin notched up another win over another rookie quarterback. And I also just think the Steelers just have better offensive weapons, especially with Christian Watson getting a back injury and possibly concussion. The Steelers have a significant edge wide receiver. And the last time we made one in Pittsburgh, you have to go all the way back to week 12 of the 1970 season in order to uh, find the last time when the Packers went into Pittsburgh and won a game. So, should be an interesting game, but I am not sold on Jordan Love at all. I'm really not that sold on Kenny Pickett either, but I do feel like Kenny Pickett, with how he's been playing, and how that defense will be able to hold on for the most part through contact in a a lot of different ways. I ha that, but That's why I have Pittsburgh winning this game based on their defense, healthier roster, and just more grit and toughness than I've seen out of Green Bay in quite some time. So that's why I like Pittsburgh here. Minus three and a half for Pittsburgh straight up. The next game, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers over the Tennessee Titans. This is one to where I'm going to trust Baker to outbeat Levis. And you could say, look, Matt, you're falling yourself into a trap. You did this just last week with the Texans and Bucks, and you're going to go with the Bucks again. Why? And that's a great question. I'm going with the Tampa Buccaneers again because I do not believe in the Titans' offensive line being fully healthy or being able to go. They all suffered nagging injuries and knocked them out through portions of the game. And Baker, I thought, played well. He threw for about 270 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions, and drove them down the field to get the game-winning touchdown to go up 37-33. to But when you see how well the Texans quarterback has played, I do believe believe that, you know, Tampa uh, definitely let one go away. Though I do want to shout out Rashad, uh, Rashad White. He had a career high in rushing touchdowns with two. Uh, and they have been a phenomenal run defense. They only held Devin Singletary to about 20 six yards, but they have a top 10 run defense, but a horrible pass defense. And I just think at the end of the day where I see enough potential out of Will Levis that could they beat the Buccaneers? Absolutely. But I am going to take, I'm, I'm going to take Tampa Bay here just based on the experience and the offensive line and receiving injuries, especially with Traylon Burks. 
if the Bucks defense can use that top 10 run defense to limit Henry to an extent, I do not believe Will Levis in his third career game will be able to play nearly as he did in week one or his first game against the, the Falcons. And I, I don't think that luck continues going through Tampa in a tough, gritty game where you've at least some time to prepare for. So, But that is why I like Tampa Bay here. Minus one, Tampa Bay straight up. The next game, the... Jacksonville Jaguars over the San Francisco 49ers. This one, ladies and gentlemen, is basically where I am going to trust the better quarterback and the more healthier roster than I would the 49ers. It was amazing to me that I saw this game and it was a three-point spread because I did not believe that that game should have been that close. I honestly thought have thought it would have been the Jags should be slight favorites since they are home. But no, people are really buying into the 49ers getting fully healthy at the offensive line, at Debo coming back in, and I just see this game for the Niners to be incredibly important because, excuse me, if they lose this one, then the the 49ers are genuine, for you know, fraudulent type of things, and honestly, then the NFC completely runs through Philadelphia. I'd make it to where Philadelphia, if you're talking about the solar system, would be the massive center, and every other team in the NFC would be circling around it. And the reason I'm going with Jacksonville as well is the last two games, opposing quarterbacks have put 82% of their passes on this defense. Um, and they have the third, the Jags have the third best running defense in the NFL. So I'm not saying Christopher McCaffrey is going to get completely stymied, but he's going to get he's going to earn every single yard that the Jags allow him to get through his offensive line. And also the Jags, they're 14-4 and four in their last 18 games, and Travis Etienne would be, would ha- has the third most rushing touchdowns in the league, which I think is incredibly impressive, just seeing where team, uh, Travis Etienne was a couple years ago, coming off an Achilles injury, uh, not even before his rookie year began. The San Fran has won four straight games against the Jags. I just think with the Jags coming in fully rested, a bit more rested, having all their pieces together, and not knowing exactly the status of all the Niners, I'll stick with Jacksonville based on them just having a better playmaker and a more athletic playmaker than they do with the Niners. So, but uh, but that's why I like. Jacksonville here, plus three, and Jacksonville straight up. The next game, the Baltimore Ravens over the Cleveland Browns. I'm going to shout out Keaton Mitchell and Odo Beckham Jr. Nine carries for 138 yards and a touchdown. And Odo Beckham got his first touchdown as a Raven as well. They, The entire team played absolutely sensationally. They, The Ravens have a top six offense and defense. Geno, Geno Stone... Got another interception, which extends his lead to about six interceptions throughout this season, which is remarkable. And when I look at it uh, that way with the Ravens, they have played their they have played the Lions and Seahawks in their last two home games, and they have won seventy five to nine in those games, which is absolutely remarkable, knowing how dominant the Ravens can be. And, look, when you look at the Browns here, that defense is legitimate. Like I said to people earlier in the video, they held, they held the Cardinals, even with their third-string quarterback, to 58 total yards. Miles Garrett has been an absolute beast. He, uh, two of their, you know, two of their first eight games under 100 total yards. And I just feel like in this game, especially with the Browns losing their left tackle and their right tackle, that the Ravens should win based off of that. Lamar Jackson has only lost one time, or he, he has a phenomenal record against the Browns and Bengals. He rarely ever loses to them at home. I feel like Lamar, who's leading the league now, completion percentages is massive. And the Ravens just understand how important this game is just based on what's coming up after it. It is a gauntlet of a schedule with a lot of big opponents. 
and I do believe that the uh, Ravens hang on and grind out an incredibly hard and uh, tough victory. Also, the other the other key thing with the tackles being gone is our pass rush, which, which has been one of the two or four best in the league, is going to have a field day without no Jack Conklin or Jedrick Wells. So, I wouldn't be surprised if the Browns won based on the fact of how, you know, I've seen them play. But, and give me the Ravens, 4-1 all-time at home against the Browns in the home game for Lamar Jackson. And I think the uh, Ravens grind out a tough, gritty victory. But I will take Cleveland plus 6.5 because of the respect I have for the Browns defensive unit. So that's why I like uh, Baltimore here to win straight up. But Cleveland plus 6.5. The next game, the Arizona Cardinals over the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, this is one to where the Cardinals are a train wreck. And I will just say this now, okay? Like, a couple of these games I'm not really going to talk about because there's not a lot to talk about in terms of the game. But I'm going with Arizona here based on how I believe Kyler Murray will be back. And from what I saw out of the Falcons, even though John New Smith had a, a season-long 60-yard reception, Kyle Pitts had 46 yards receiving, who made all his field goals. They all played well, but they decided to give Taylor Heineke another opportunity. And if Kyler Murray can play against Taylor Heineke, Kyler and the Cardinals win that game easily and effectively. If they don't bring him in or if they don't allow him to make his de season debut against the... Against the against the Falcons, then they are telling you at that point they are genuinely trying to tank for one of the better quarterbacks in this in, the, in this class. So, but I do believe Kyler will return. Not even if it's for the sake of winning, because I, I, I don't even think Kyler should be able to win out the rest of these games. But it's to give the Cardinals an audition to see where. Kyler can go, or what team would take Kyler's contract along with all the money on it, depending on how he plays. So, I think this game is going to be one of the worst ones of the week. Probably the second worst game of the weekend. There's one coming up a little bit here I'll mention that I believe is going to be the worst. But I'm going to take uh, Arizona here based on Kyler Murray return. If he doesn't, I will tell everybody to switch their pick. I'm going to switch my pick to Atlanta. Both against spread and straight up. And Atlanta has been a pathetic road team all year. Even with Heineke playing in some of these games. But I think the uh, Cardinals hang on and get a massive second W. And knock the Falcons completely reeling into a tailspin of like, can we beat the really bad teams? Because it seems like you guys can. So, But that's why I like uh, Arizona here plus two and a half. And Arizona straight up. But once again, if Kyler Murray is playing, and the other guys are, I will switch the down and say I believe the Cardinals get win straight up, or the Falcons win straight up, and the Falcons get the against the spread pick as well. So, But that's why I like uh, Arizona here, plus two and a half, and Arizona straight up. The next game, the Detroit Lions over the Los Angeles Chargers. Outside of the Ravens game, the Lions have put up 20-plus points in every single game this year. And they're coming off a game where Jameer Gibbs, their running back, had a sensational day. 189 scrimmage yards. And Amon Ross St. Brown threw 40 games at the most receiving yards at 2,738. Calvin Johnson had the previous record at 2,694. No. No, it's not, but... Like, when you look at this Lions-Charger game, it's something where the Chargers have all the talent in the world... And the Chargers, here's a crazy stat for everybody. They are 22-6 and six when the defense hold, when the Chargers defense holds a team to 28 or fewer points. Herbert is 22-6. and six. I just think the issue is, is that nobody really believes that the Chargers defense going against that Lions offense will be able to hold them into a 3-4 to four score hole. So... 
The Lions defense has been absolutely fantastic. And uh, the Lions have never won a road game against the Chargers in franchise history. But in a game like this with two high-quality offenses, I'm going to trust the coaching aspect in this matter. And it is Dan Campbell. The Lions have only lost four times over the last couple years since Week 9. And I believe the Lions come back incredibly impressed and confident going through this stretch run that they can make the playoffs probably win the division. If they lose one of these games, now the division with Minnesota is now back in play. So it, it should be a very interesting game between the Lions and Chargers. Both high-quality offenses, very different sides of the ball. It definitely seems like they like to rely on their coordinators more to make decisions than make their own in key spots. But with that being said, I trust the uh, Detroit Lions in this game to play efficient, consistent, and effective football like they played most of the year. And it's going to be in Los Angeles, which basically means also that the Lions will have a significant home field advantage. <laughs> so that's why I like Detroit here, minus one and a half, and Detroit straight up. Then the next game, the Dallas Cowboys over the New York Giants. I'm just gonna, I, I really didn't even write anything down because Daniel Jones has torn his ACL. He is out for the rest of the year, which means that Ty, and with Tyrod Taylor having a rib injury, uh, this shows that for, for, the, uh, for the Cowboys, this is going to be an absolute slaughter. They played this team in week one. It was 40 to nothing. It is a 16 and a half point spread. But if you're going to start with Tommy DeVito or Matt Barkley going into this game, that's your quarterback, you are going to get absolutely your teeth kicked in, the tar kicked out of you by the Cowboys. The Cowboys at home this year have already beaten the Jets by 24, the Patriots by 35, and they beat the Rams by over 20 plus. So what would you what would what would make people think that the Giants going into Dallas with all the problems they have offensively? A lost season by which any other name could be called. And I'm going I'm laying the 16 and a half because I just think it's gonna be that dominant of a beating that puts the uh, Giants out of their misery. So that game really is gonna be fun. Take Dallas, put all your money on the Dallas line, because I money line at least, 16 and a half. If they don't get another quarterback, take that too. But if they do, just be warned that, that line is very high and it could cause cause a frustration as well. So but that's why I like uh, Dallas here, minus 16.5, and, and Dallas straight up. The next game, the Seattle Seahawks over the Washington Commanders. This is one to where, look, Washington was 9-17 on third down. Jahan Dotson now in back-to-back -back game just caught touchdowns, which is incredibly impressive. And uh, they, the uh, outside of the Ramondre Stevenson run, Yesterday for the Patriots, the other several carries they held the command they held the Patriot the Commanders held the Patriots to about two point four yards of rush. And look, that defense was stout. Sam Howell got another win. He's four and five. He's got about sixty six percent completion percentage, four TDs, five INTs. It's not great by any means. It's mediocre, but he's shown in more spots than not that he can play consistent clutch football when they need him to do it and they are playing a Seahawk team that is reeling based off the beatdown they took against Baltimore yesterday that is the lowest amount of total yards uh for the Seahawks as an offense since week eight of the 2014 season when they I think beat the Rams 14 to 9 and in a weird NFC West ready type of game and here was the sad thing for the Seahawks as well if you take out that 50 yard pass the Seahawks ran 42 plays for 135 total yards, which is about 3.21 yards per play, which is, which is insane. And for everybody out there that believes in Geno, Geno the bum. Geno the bum has had four touchdowns to six interceptions over the last four games. He made Jared Goff, who played that same Ravens team a couple weeks ago, he made Jared Goff look like Patrick Mahomes. Like, I'm sorry, like, Gino, he's not that guy. He's not that guy, everybody. Gino is an awkward placeholder that is going to get by by just 
having enough to give you a contract that is respectable and Geno could get you to the playoffs, maybe win you a playoff game at most. But every time you see Geno Smith, there was a reason why Geno had been what he had been for 10 years. He was the bum of the Jets that out th- that, that got to outplay Mark Sanchez. He was the scrub that got punched out by a defensive lineman and had a and gave Ryan Fitzpatrick his career year. He was the moron that Eli Manning got benched for. And this is the, the Geno Smith that I've come to know, which is a Geno that, again, he is a okay starting quarterback, but to commit to him more than a year is was always going to be a problem. So, But with all that being said, they are playing the Commanders who have Sam Howell, who is nowhere in Geno's league, and the Seahawks... Uh, they're tr- they're going to try something very hard that has uh, been rare for them. The last time Seattle beat Washington at home in a regular season game, they won the last two playoff games actually pretty effectively at home, was back in week three of the 98 season. So, and, you know, and I think the anger from Seattle, Washington having to go all the way out there, and just knowing how Sam Howell's been inconsistent up and down all the way through, I don't think the commander's defense after losing... Montez Sweat and Chase Young to trade to the Niners and Bears, respectively. I don't think that he has enough juice to uh, hold on and effectively keep this competitive game against a weaker Washington defense with the weapons they have offensively. They'll, they'll all rebound. Kenneth Charbonnet, the entire offense, will rebound incredibly well. And I, I think the Seahawks roll easily in a nice bounce back for them after the embarrassment of uh, what happened against Baltimore. Same thing happened to Detroit just a couple weeks ago. We embarrassed Detroit the next the next week. The Lions held the Raiders to their lowest uh, offensive yardage out there. It got Josh McDaniels fired. Jared Goff and then played well, and they feel better now going to the stretch one, playing a Charger team, which is a lot more competent and respectable. And I think it's the same thing with Seattle. I think play after this week, they have... A game against the Niners. I believe. So, we shall see. But that's why I like uh, Seattle here, minus six, and Seattle straight up. The final two games the New York Jets over the Las Vegas Raiders. This is one to where I am really torn about this because I was really impressed with what Antonio Pierce did against the Giants. I said that earlier. And it was a 24 point turnaround, which was the second largest win for a midseason firing. Since 2015, when, ironically, Dan Campbell, who I mentioned earlier, did it against uh, the Dolphins and had a 28-point win against the Texans, I believe. So, um, But the Raiders, I thought, look, Max Crosby, phenomenal. He's leading the league in tackles for loss. Had a season high in sacks with three. But it's just one of those aspects to where if they're going to go of Aiden O'Connell, Aiden O'Connell played the Chargers defense. And I, I trust Zach Wilson enough to be a competent enough quarterback with the defense and run game and weapons that they have, the Jets have offensively, that they should be able to win this one in a tough and gritty fashion. And also for Robert Sala, this is a big game for Mr. Sala because objectively, he needs to show that he's not a bum, that he's not garbage, okay? Because lose, you know, like losing the night against the Chargers... You know, which I have, you know, that's not a bad thing. I don't think Robert Sala is a good coach. Uh, you know, haven't had been for basically the past couple years. Uh, but losing to Antonio Pierce is a completely different thing. Basically losing to a, light, a lighter-skinned version of you, in terms of just like Antonio Pierce and Sala, where like, you know, they, they, you know, they basically take just different facial features. And losing to a guy in his second career, you know, game, like... You don't want to be the, 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 don't let Antonio Pierce, Salah, don't be the McDaniels to the Jeff Saturday situation in that regard. Okay, because at least at the end of the day for the Giants this week, they had an excuse with Dayball getting, or with uh, Jones getting hurt. I'm not saying that game might have changed or that, you know, but they were playing with a guy that really should be back in groceries or going up, uh, you know, to, uh, New Jersey and meeting David Chase for the Sopranos and Tommy DeVito. Uh, Danny DeVito's uh, long-lost son. 
but you know, for Sala losing to Antonio Pierce, who you know was who was a former player and you know has done you know a pretty good job of motivating and inspiring, you're the better coach. You've done this now going into your fourth or yeah, going into your uh, third season. Don't let Antonio Pierce in a home environment beat you to show that maybe you do have more problems because you're coming off that giant game it's itself, and that was a really tough look. But thankfully you won. Losing to the Raiders on the road, that's not the bad thing. But losing to Antonio Pierce, I think, would be the most significant blow to Salah or anybody having any legitimate credibility connected to. So, should be a great game. And again, I would tell people, if you want to take the Raiders plus two, that's probably a pretty good pick. I'm going to regret probably not doing it. But I'm going to take the Jets just based on the defense being more consistent and having a higher opportunity compared to what I see out of the Raiders. O'Connell is going to, you know, run into a much tougher threat, and I think the Jets' defense can make enough mistakes, cause enough mistakes and get enough stops. Zach Wilson can make some plays against the tough and beat-up Raiders secondary, possibly without Marcus Peters, to win the game and get the Jets to at least uh, a 5-4 and four record through nine games, which I did not expect that I could say about the Jets. So. But that's why I like the uh, New York Jets here, minus two, and New York Jets straight up. And lastly, the Buffalo Bills over the Denver Broncos. Uh, I like the uh, Buffalo Bills here just based on the fact that the Bills, they seem to usually beat these kind of teams. Denver and Tampa are about the same to me. And, you know, I, I think Russ is playing better than Baker is throughout this year at this point. And the Bills defense is nowhere near the talent and skill that I brought in at the beginning of the season for all the injuries. And I think the thing for me is I just think the Bills, usually when they lose tough games, they go into the next game and really land a big punch, knockout type punch. And this Broncos team, which has given up 70 this year before, blew a 21 point lead earlier. I just feel like for the uh, Bills, this is going to be a get right game for them. But the reason, because I think the Bills, you know, they have the better weapons. They have the better running attack. They have the better quarterback. The home field environment in the cold. Russell Wilson, the last couple times he's going up to Buffalo, he has not played that well. In fact, I could argue, I think, I don't think he's ever won a game. He's only won one time in Buffalo throughout his career. The other times he got bum-rushed by uh, the Bills against with, with Seattle. And now against Buffalo, too. So, And and look, it's going to be a tough tough order. Russ is 10-5 and all-time in Monday Night Football games. And he has the fifth highest quarterback rating in the league. But the reason why I'm taking Denver plus seven and a half is because I do believe that defense is damaged goods for the Bills from a lot of different ways. From Milano to White to Draymond or to Day, I'm sorry, not Draymond, Daquan to Micah to Poyer to Bernard to, you know, all the Bills defensive injuries. I think it is way too much to uh, trust them to hold on in this spot. So that's all I'll take Denver plus seven and a half because of the Bills defensive injuries. But I'd like the Bills here to win this game. Primetime spot. Allen's usually pretty good in this spot. I think they rebound very nicely to uh, get a win and keep their playoff hopes still floating around. But that's why I like Buffalo here straight up, but Denver plus seven and a half. And that is it. So those are my picks for this week. Like, comment, rate, and subscribe. Please check out the NFL YouTube prognosticator page on Facebook. So many great progs from Andrew Warren, uh, Geo Knows, Bridgewater's Finest, Half Moon's Picks, Logan Schiff. All those guys and gals make predictions like I do. And go check them out. And until next week for Week 11, pre-Thanksgiving week, for my Week 11 predictions, good luck to all players, coaches, teams, fantasy players, and fellow prognosticators. And until next time, everyone, this is Matthew Phoenix signing off. Till then, everyone, so long.